Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Michael Newman. I'm the chief executive of the AJR, the Association of Jewish Refugees. It's a very great pleasure to welcome you. I'm going to speak uh, again in a few moments, but first of all, it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, Minister of State for the Middle East, North Africa, South Asia, and the UN, and the Prime Minister's special representative on preventing sexual violence in conflict, Lord Ahmed. Well, good morning, Your Excellencies, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, dear friends. We come together this morning, 80 years, 80 years since the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Literally thousands of thousands of Jewish residents refused through incredible displays of courage and bravery to surrender to the Nazis. They refused to be sent to their deaths. On a personal note of reflection, I visited the museum in Warsaw, the site of what was the ghetto as it was described, on the very site where the ghetto once stood. And as I walked through the museum, I stood in awe of those, not people, I would describe them as heroes, who said simply, we will stand up and we will fight back. I've also had the immense honor to honor the memory of those who perished in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I was saying just now downstairs, as I arrived, that I remember as a minister in the communities department over a decade ago, making that first trip to Auschwitz, making that visit to Birkenau, and doing it with a group of students, young people, 16, 17 year olds, who were buzzing with incredible excitement as we made our way on the plane towards Poland. Then as we arrived at the camp, at Auschwitz to begin with, silence. Silence transcended. Never have I seen 16 and 70 year olds, I've got a 17 year old myself at the moment, fall so silent so quickly. Yet they also reflected. They reflected in the eeriness of the silence that confronted them, but also the memories of those who perished. And as we walked the path across Auschwitz and Birkenau, those humbling experiences that I've experienced, be it at the site of the ghetto in Warsaw, at it, out Auschwitz, at Birkenau. And perhaps in a current context, as we see the continuing war on Ukraine, it seems a long time ago, but it was only recently, before, just before the war started, that I had the honor to visit Ukraine Kyiv, and go to the site at Babinia with our excellent ambassador, Melinda Simmons, together with the German president, the Ukrainian president, marking the opening of the site, which again saw the most horrific abhorrent crimes against humanity. It was equally tragic in the march of that conflict only last year, getting a call from our ambassador and saying, Minister, you recall that we visited Babin Yar to mark the memory of those who perished. Tragically, we have a missile that's landed on that very site. And I share that with you because perhaps it also is an important reminder to us that we must preserve memories and never be deterred through those who seek to eradicate memories, eradicate people, eradicate communities. The stories of the millions murdered during the Holocaust must absolutely never leave us. But there is, if I may put it this way, a real concern, a concern that exists and increases every year. With every year that passes, there are fewer and fewer survivors left to tell their phenomenal, courageous stories. 
The Holocaust, if we do not act, will no longer be part of our living history. Therefore, it's incumbent we do all we can to ensure those incredible voices are not left just to history, but are preserved for generations to come. As Elie Wiesel once said, it is the duty of the survivor to bear witness for the dead and for the living, to tell future generations of a past that belongs to our collective memory. Therefore, Your Excellencies, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it has never been more important that our close collaboration continues to be strengthened. I wish, if I may, to thank the Association of Jewish Refugees for organizing this conference in partnership with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And if I may pay a particular tribute to my dear friend, Lord Pickles, who does a phenomenal amount of work as a special envoy for post-Holocaust issues. I have a great fondness deep in my heart for Eric. He was my first boss twice over. <laughs> the fact I'm still standing here as a minister shows that he trained me well. <laughs> But in all honesty, he has shown incredible commitment year after year. And I look forward to continuing my partnership, my friendship, but also our collaborative work as we work towards ensuring the preservation of these incredible memories. Through this conference and commending the organizers once again and our future work together, we will do our part. Each of us must play our part to protect Holocaust survivors' voices. Their stories will ensure that no one, no one can question the basic facts of the Holocaust. Their words of truth will drown out, and there are tragically still, this prevails, drown out the lies about what happened. And their experiences will help the world to learn. Because history matters. But equally, we say it time and time again, must never be allowed to repeat itself. Yet tragically, it does. The UK on our part will continue to do all we can to defend freedom and protect the truth. We will continue to strive to work with friends and allies around the world to ensure that facts, facts stand the test of time and stand by those who were there through courage to share their testimonies and at the same time standing up to those who wish to deny and distort these very facts. This includes our commitment to create a new national memorial to honor the Jewish men, women, and children who were murdered in the Holocaust and all other victims of Nazi persecution. It also means working with our international partners. As president of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance next year, and our funding of the Weiner Holocaust Library right here in London. The library will play a vital and continues to play a vital role in helping survivors and their des descendants piece together their own histories, hosting now more than 30 million pages of documents, telling the stories of more than 17 million people. And I'm also, if I may say this, proud that many British diplomats played their part in helping to save Jewish lives. And if I may, I would just like to share one example illustrating what I would describe the best of human spirit. From March 1938, a brave team of foreign office and church officials in Vienna worked together in danger to their own lives to provide ta travel documents and baptismal certificates for Jews desperate to cross Austria's borders, simply to survive, to cross to safety. Hundreds of baptisms were carried out each day, and the diplomatic team worked around the clock to exploit all possible loopholes for issuing travel permits and emergency passports, even going as far as issuing fake documents as well. This wasn't easy. It was a very dangerous business. 
two members of this courageous group were interrogated and beaten by the Nazis, whilst the Jewish-born Virgo of the Christchurch was sent to Auschwitz, where he sadly and tragically died. But it's thanks to their efforts, their courage, this team saved, importantly, tens of thousands of lives. Until recently, many of their names were unknown. And we, as the modern-day Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, are determined that they too shall not be forgotten. So on March 7th this year, relatives of survivors and British officials joined memorial and faith groups, together with my dear friend, Lord Pickles, to unveil the plaque on the wall of the British Embassy building facing Christ's church doors. And earlier this week, the UK government again stood in solidarity, as we all did, with the Jewish community in marking Yom HaShoah. Its internal theme of remembering the past, honoring the memory and shaping the future has never been important. You know, I just had the opportunity to read some of the testimonies in this excellent exhibition. Simple in its production, poignant and powerful in the testimonies of the words of survivors. Many captured my attention, but in particular, Walter Bruner. And I paraphrase him because I literally just see, saw what he'd written. But it was all about each of us taking responsibility. Here was someone who survived the worst kind of torture, the worst kind of attacks on him as a person, as a human being, simply because of his faith. Yet his reflection was not revenge, but he says, and please do read that quote, he says, try to help people, love people, love the community, do your part before it's too late. Many people played a phenomenal role during the time of the Holocaust and continue to do that today. But ultimately, we owe an immense debt of gratitude to the incredible survivors of the Holocaust, victims who became survivors, who became advocates. And together, we must ensure their voices, their testimonies are protected and strengthened for generations to come. And that we can also say in Walter's words that we did our part to help people and that their memories never, ever fade. And when we reflect back on our own efforts, we can say we did not forget. Thank you. Lord Ahmed, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, also for your uh, generous hospitality for this fabulous and prestigious building. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Miguel Berger, the German ambassador to the UK, to say a few words. Ambassador. Lord Ahmed, uh, Lord Pickles, dear Michael, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me as the German ambassador to join you um, in welcoming um, all of you here to Lancaster House at the beginning of this two days conference. In the course of my first year in the United Kingdom, I've been very privileged to meet many Holocaust survivors and kinder of the first and second generation. All of them extraordinary people who faced horrors and immense personal loss. Their strength and generosity in sharing their testimonies is and remains an inspiration. But it is up to all of us to ensure that their voices and their message of freedom, tolerance, and care for others continue to be heard. Therefore, allow me to extend my heartfelt thanks to the Association of Jewish Refugees and their dedicated friends and partners, particularly the FCDO, for bringing together such an impressive number of distinguished scholars and educators from a great variety of disciplines 
as well as descendants of Holocaust survivors in order to explore the question on how we can keep these memories alive for a larger audience across the world in the face of the ever dwindling numbers of survivors and kinder. Today, and Lord Ahmed mentioned it, uh, in Warsaw, the presidents of Israel, of Germany and Poland will commemorate the 80 years of the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto. And let me add that we feel really privileged and honored to be part of this memory today. Later this year, we are going to commemorate 85 years of the first tragic culmination of the racial hatred of the Nazi regime, the night of the 9th to the 10th of November 1938, when synagogues were set on fire, Jewish shops destroyed and raided, and many people killed. 30,000 Jewish men were imprisoned in concentration camps. The anniversaries of the beginning of the kinder transports and the November programs serve as a powerful call to action and an important reminder that we must prevent anti-Semitism, racism, and populism from taking root again in our societies. Today, Holocaust denial is again gaining traction, allowing anti-Semitism to inch towards the mainstream. Not so long ago, we had to witness brazen outbursts of Holocaust distortion and denial, conspiracy theories, demonstrations against COVID-19 restrictions, all of them mixed around the world. Populist propaganda is still on the rise. Old certainties are crumbling. Liberal values, the universal validity of human rights, and the rule of law are under attack. Against this backdrop, it is all the more important to tackle these challenges. And this conference will do that through the lens of the experience of survivors and to focus on how we can together continue their work towards a world free from prejudice, persecution, and violence. With fewer and fewer eyewitnesses, Zeitzeugen in German, among us to bear testimony and events like in the November programs are at risk of increasingly becoming events from history. Therefore, we must make sure that this shift from personal living memory to museums, to digital solutions, to monuments, to research, to books and works of art does not allow the historical truth to slowly fade away into the bookshelves or into routine exam questions. The Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel once said, and I quote, anyone listening to a time witness today will become a witness himself, end of quote. In this spirit, it must remain our first duty to remember those who were murdered, to honor those who survived and be a witness, and to strive to ensure that the horrors of the past will never be repeated. The topic of national socialism and the Holocaust is firmly anchored in the school curricula of each of the federal states in Germany. These lessons often include first-hand testimonies, above all from Holocaust survivors or kinder, such as Kurt Marx, who is with us today. Furthermore, many projects, programs, and initiatives offered by NGOs or non-formal education institutions in Germany teach about the Holocaust, including essential testimonies from survivors. There are around 300 memorial museums and documentation sites, as well as other commemorative sites in Germany, bearing witness to the horrors perpetrated by the Nazi regime and commemorating victims' groups. A significant number are deemed of national importance, including former concentration camps as Buchenwald, Bergen-Belsen, and Oranienburg. 
the memorial sites are today an integral component of Germany's political culture. Remembrance of the Holocaust and the Nazi rule of terror is recognized and firmly established as a national responsibility. Remembering has to be more than the duty of governments, authorities, and institutions. It has to be, first and foremost, the duty of each and every one of us. Therefore, we have to keep defending our liberal values, which are fragile and precious, and which we too often take for granted. We need a strong, active, and resilient civil society to deny anti-Semitism its breeding ground. We are stepping up the fight against anti-Semitism and Holocaust distortion, both, both at home and abroad. Today, Germany is once more home to 200,000 Jews, and for us, the Jewish community is a fundamental part of our society, a truly extraordinary gift for Germany. At the embassy in London, we also observe with gratitude the growing number of British citizens with Jewish roots who are taking the huge step of reclaiming their German identity. And with changes that we have made to our legislation, enabling easier naturalization for descendants of victims of persecution by the Nazis are now in place, and we hope that we are able to welcome many more back to our and their former national, uh, German nationality and that they obtain their naturalization. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by once again thanking all the organizers of this conference, the speakers and attendees for contributing so generously and with so much dedication to a crucial and necessary discussion that will ultimately define us as societies. Thank you very much. Well, Lord Ahmed, uh, Lord Pickles, Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure and pride that I welcome you to Remembering and Rethinking, the International Forum on Collecting, Preserving and Disseminating Holocaust Testimonies, and to this prestigious and wonderful location. My colleagues and I very much hope this will be a fascinating uh, two days of insight and discussion. Lord Ahmed, we are enormously grateful to you and your colleagues at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office for enabling the AJR to again make use of Lancaster House and for your fabulous and generous hospitality. As if the extensive program we have curated wasn't enough, the chance for us all to recreate scenes from the crown by walking regally up and down the magnificent staircases has been a huge draw. Thank you very much. Lord Pickles, the AJR is also indebted to you for enabling us to be here. It is a great pleasure to work so closely with you on a number of post-Holocaust issues, and I'm grateful for your continued passionate support for our work. Thank you very much as well. And we're delighted to welcome you all, AGR members, including some of the first generation survivors and refugees, colleagues, partners, campaigners from around the world to this forum. For some of you, it's a welcome back as you were with us when we held our last gathering here, when we staged the International Forum on the Kinder Transport in April 2019. We were delighted then to bring together researchers, educators, campaigners, and colleagues from governments and NGOs to examine the history and legacy of the rescue of the child refugees. Others here might have attended the international forum we organized on the second generation at Chelsea Football Club in October 2021, when we likewise brought together activists, teachers, and speakers to discuss and gain perspectives of being a descendant of a Holocaust refugee or survivor. So as well as being the third in our series, 
This forum similarly reflects our role as a convener, but also as an agency with institutional knowledge and memory imbued by the testimonies, the accounts, experiences, and anecdotes of those who witnessed National Socialism. From our founding in 1941 by the refugees who fled Central Europe, we are today proud to be the national organization representing and supporting Holocaust refugees and survivors and their descendants. And while the collecting, preserving and disseminating of Holocaust testimonies is part of our mission, our primary and overriding objective is to deliver social and welfare assistance to ensure that all those who escaped and survived can live in comfort, dignity and security. So although tangential to our proceedings, this is an unashamed request to please let us know about or refer to us any first generation you know who might now need assistance. And in case you're not yet an AJR member, we've handily enclosed an enrollment form and a pen in your folder. But our mission extends beyond this direct support to the first generation. We're increasingly engaging with the descendants of the refugees and survivors so that the second and third and even the fourth generations can be part of our work and perpetuate the legacies and stories of those who perished and those who survived. For all of this, testimonies are crucial. We're also a leading benefactor of educational and commemorative projects and programs, working with organizations in Britain and around the world. And we've created our own resources, such as our interactive UK Holocaust map, with which we're delighted to partner with the British government, and our testimony collections, My Story and Refugee Voices. One such interview was one of the first we completed with Max Abraham 20 years ago in March 2003. Max was an exemplary leader and a teacher for the Ort School and spent some time at the Kitchener camp. He was a hugely popular AJR member. But without our interview, his story and the fate of his family many of whom perished in Auschwitz, might never have been captured. We would not have known how he was designated as a friendly alien as opposed to being an enemy alien, or that he avoided internment, and that part of his motivation for naturalizing as British after the war was to know that he is something. We likewise would not have known that he and his wife, Hanny were one of the last couples to marry at the iconic Oranienburger Strasse Synagogue in Berlin in 1938, for which they later celebrated their platinum anniversary, and for which, at that time, he needed to ask special permission from the police to have a gathering of 30 people at their home afterwards. This is the true value and purpose of collecting testimonies. We also gained an insight into his thinking when he was asked whether he felt British or German and he replied, slightly anglicized, but I still have a lot of German blood. I'm very accurate with everything. And through a remark at the end of his interview when he says to Bayer, I phoned you this morning. Oh, why, Bayer replies, to make sure you're coming. Perhaps this too gives an insight into the Yekka mentality and heritage that has also been preserved, and which is regularly captured in the AJR journal which has chronicled the lives of the refugees and remembering that distinct Middle Europa heritage. <coughs> Friends, we meet during an eventful week when we also mark Yom HaShoah, the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, as we've heard, but also the 78th anniversary of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. A fortnight ago, we celebrated the festival of Passover, and while the story of Pesach narrates the parallel history of oppression meted out by an evil tyrant, the instruction on Pesach is to tell the story. It's even reflected in the name of the book we use, the Haggadah, the telling. And we extend that message into the proceedings today and tomorrow. As well as having captured the stories for posterity and study, it is imperative to use them, to enable access to them, so that the stories of what happened and the dangers of anti-Semitism and extreme nationalism can be learned. 
In the lead up to the forum, some of you may have seen the series of clips on our social media with contributors explaining why Holocaust testimony matters. Capturing stories for the future, recording family experiences, and remembering the Holocaust were all some of the rationale our respondents gave. My answer was to guard against the scourge of Holocaust denial and distortion. In the span of history, 80 years is relatively short, but just a few decades since the end of the Holocaust, there is a pernicious and growing threat as to how that history is preserved and remembered. Whereas we consider it unimaginable that such terror could ever be questioned, there are those who seek to deny, to trivialize, to diminish and distort. Testimonies act as the antidote to this falsification. And it is our hope that these two days will reinvigorate our collective determination to pass on the stories for future generations. Just a couple of small housekeeping points. You can follow the proceedings from the program in your pack, which also includes a copy of this month's AGR journal and a commemorative booklet for you to make notes. But you can also click on the QR code on your folders, which will take you through to the AGR link tree, where you can see a range of digital resources, as well as the program and biographies of our speakers. I also strongly encourage you to dive, to dive into the links to read about and hear our testimonies, and to see our social media posts and explore our websites, which will include the recording for the proceedings today and tomorrow. You can also use the hashtag here, why Holocaust testimony matters, to tweet about your thoughts on the proceedings. There is much to see, but please do so after the speakers have finished. You may also have seen on arrival that there is a number of our partner organizations have displays in what we've called a marketplace downstairs. You can learn more about projects that are advancing knowledge and awareness about the Holocaust. We are grateful to them and to all our partners who have helped us promote the forum. Thank you all very much. I would like to end by thanking a number of people for making today and tomorrow possible. Firstly, to our colleagues in government. In, our in addition to Lord Ahmed, I would particularly like to thank Kirsty Nash and Juliet Waterbot Bryan from the FCDO. Thank you very much. And as well as Lord Pickles, to thank Sally Seely for her guidance, counsel, and behind the scenes interventions. We look forward to continuing to work closely with you both, uh, including during the UK presidency of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance next year. We're also very grateful to His Excellency Miguel Berger, the German ambassador, not only for his introductory remarks. Uh, this morning, but also for hosting us at a reception this evening. You're spending a long time with us today, Ambassador. Thank you very much. And as well as our speakers, I also want to pay tribute to my colleagues who have breathed this forum and little else for the past few months, to Alex Moores, our Head of Education and Heritage, to Clara Berger and Greta Bauer, our volunteers from Action Reconciliation Service for Peace, to Susanna Kleeman for the, producing the digital materials to Deborah Barnes and Gemma Blaine for promoting the forum. I also particularly want to thank Ros Hart, Karen Diamond, and especially Susan Howard for so expertly organizing and delivering this conference. Thank you all very much. And lastly, to Dr. Bea Lefkowitz, who as well as directing the Refugee Voices Archive, conceived the idea for this forum, and who has led the way to curate an extensive program through which we hope we can achieve our objective to analyze, assess, and evaluate how Holocaust testimonies are collected, preserved, and disseminated. Colleagues, we have a busy program. We wish you all an enlightening and illuminating two days. Thank you very much. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce the Right Honorable Lord Pickles, who, as well as being the UK Special Envoy for Post-Holocaust Issues, Head of the UK Delegation to the IRA, Co-Chair of the UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation, 
and the UK's representative to the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation. He's also a very good friend of the AJR. Thank you, Lord Pickles. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, you referred uh, to us all of an opportunity to walk among the set of the crown. There is one significant difference between Buckingham Palace and, and Lancaster House. In the opinion of Queen Victoria, Lancaster House is far grander. <laughs> so do enjoy yourself. It was a particular pleasure to, uh, to, to listen uh, uh, Your Excellency to your, your speech. And it's good on a time to reflect that the modern Germany has done so much uh, to deal with um, the residue of the past, the memory of the past, and in recent years has been at the forefront of dealing with Holocaust distortion. And we are extremely grateful to your personal commitment on that. Now, my friend, um, Lord Ahmed, is right. We've worked together for many a, a long year. First at Conservative Central Office, and then we both became respectable and we, 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 uh, we, we joined the government. And um, I have to say, as, uh, as one of my ministers, ministers often take on a responsibility and they become immediately enthusiastic about it. And then when that responsibility is transferred, it's gone. From the very beginning, from the very first time that I met Tariq, his commitment to racial equality his commitment to tackling anti-Semitism has not wavered for one moment, and it is extraordinarily fortunate to have someone of his commitment working so hard in the Foreign Office. I thank you very much for that. <laughs> now, my friends, every week is uh, a week of remembrance. This week, there's been two um, events uh, to focus our thoughts on. As other speakers have said, on Monday we marked Yom Hashoah, um, a, a, a very special day to remember the six million Jews murdered in the Shoah. And of course, as a number have referred to, the uh, Warsaw Ghetto uh, uprising. Today is the 80th anniversary of that uprising, the largest form of Jewish resistance to take place during the Holocaust. It's also the first example of a mass civilian resistance to the Nazis. We remember those Jewish freedom fighters of the Warsaw Gathered also gathered testimony and evidence to ensure a permanent record of what happened during the struggle against the Nazis and their collaborators in Warsaw. Emanuel Ringblum, one of the fighters of the Warsaw Ghetto took the initiative to create a secret archive to gather material and documents relating to the experience of Jews in Poland. The archive was a code name, Ogeg Shabbat, which I understand means the pleasures of the Shabbat. The ghetto inhabitants collected material covering every aspect of life uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, ranging from diaries newspapers, official reports to posters, photographs, tram tickets, and even sweet wrappers. The documents were, were stored uh, in milk churns and boxes and buried in three separate locations in the ghetto. Only three people who had contributed to the Ogag uh, Shabbat archive survived the war. In 1946, they were able to unearth one of the milk churns. A second churn was rediscovered four years later, and the third churn is yet to be found. The testimony of Nautag Shabbat archives lives on, and it is in that spirit of preserving the truth that we meet today. Another example of early testimony uh, are, are the rediscovered recordings of Patrick Gordon Walker, later to become a member of Parliament, when he was a BBC reporter on the 20th of April 
1945, five days after Bergen-Belsen concentration camp was liberated. You will be able to see and hear that footage at the UK's new Holocaust Learning Centre. For me, it's very moving to hear survivors singing at a Shabbat service. There were other uh, earlier pioneers. Recently, uh, the Wiener Library highlighted early pioneers who took upon themselves to record um, testimony. One such pioneer was uh, Eva Reichmann, who on November 1954 issued an impassioned appeal to Holocaust survivors who had the stated their lives anew uh, in Great Britain to come to her with wartime stories. She wanted letters, diaries, photographs, documents, anything related to the horrors they had suffered under the Nazi regime and their collaborators. So that their experience could be, could be recorded and could be safeguarded forever. A parliamentary delegation was sent to eyewitness accounts after photographs of the liberated Brunenwald and Bergen-Belsen concentration camps reached the British press. They said that their object was to find out the truth while the evidence was still fresh in this important camp so that we can test the accuracy of the reports already published. Mavis Tate, the only female member of the parliamentary delegation, introduced the scenes, urging viewers, do believe me when I tell you that the reality was indescribably worse than these pictures. Over the next two days, we will discuss various audio-visual testimony, so it's worth mentioning uh, Helga uh, Goldstein testimony given to the British Film and Photographic Unit on the 24th of April, 1945. It's believed to be the first ever audiovisual testimony given by an Holocaust survivor. As a 22-year-old victim, she, put, she spoke about Bergen-Belsen and the Nazi concentration camp. Pupils now in school are the last generation to hear first-hand testimony from Holocaust survivors and refugees. So as the Holocaust moves from contemporary memory to the history books, we have an obligation to keep their testimony stark and clear. Testimony is the key to ensuring that we and future generations never forget. Most of us here have had the privilege of listening to testimony we can all remember how it impacted on us and the many cases spurred us on to, to do more things, activities relating to Holocaust remembrance. For me, it was standing with my friend, Ivor Pearl, on the separation uh, ramp at Auschwitz, where families were torn apart on a bright spring day. Ivor movingly described this moment in his memoir when he experiences firsthand. Ivor firmly grips my wrist and said, listen, Eric, don't believe all that crap about the birds never singing in Auschwitz. It was a day like this when we, when we first came here, a warm, sunny day, blue skies, cotton wool clouds, Birds were singing, and butterflies were fluttering between the lines. The Holocaust did not happen in a dark corner, hidden away. The Holocaust happened in broad daylight, in plain sight, with the world watching. It is Ivor's hard truth that I am determined to see reflected in the new Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre to be built next to Parliament in the center of our capital, in plain sight, with eyes wide open. Facts and solid historical narrative are critical to ensuring that those 
that those set on distorting the Holocaust are called to account. But we're living, but it is the living witnesses that are the ultimate tool against deniers and distorters. That's why we remain ever vigilant against how Holocaust testimony is used. We live in an age of deep fakes where it is quite possible to see, for see Holocaust survivors' testimony be manipulated to show that the Nazi concentration camps were not that bad. We, after all, have seen recently uh, the Hollywood actor, actress um, Emma Watson from um, Harry Potter series reading uh, Mein Kampf. Not her, of course, a fake voice, but her, her image. We've seen David Attenborough, the very epitome of liberal democracy, spouting anti-Semitic thoughts. Not him, of course, fake voice, but it looked, it looked convincing. So we could see ourselves saying, well, you know, we played cards with the SS and the food was a bit bland, but there was plentiful. So we need to ensure that we understand that fakery is not new. It's not about technologies. The Nazis were able to fool many when a delegation of International Red Cross visited Terechtenstadt concentration camp. The Nazis made temporary improvement to give the visitors a positive uh, impression. But this is, my, this is my concern. I think there is some blandness, some conceit, some we should relax because we can all deal with this in a technical way. So the, the answer is not technology. It's not working out a fancy uh, way of, of holding things, uh, an algorithm. But it, the thing that we need is a strong historical narrative so that when people see deep fakes, they will dismiss them out of hand, securing the knowledge that they know the truth. Today, I would like to make an important announcement alongside our trusted partners, the Association of Jewish Refugees Voice Archive, the Imperial War Museum, the Fortinoff Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies, the USC Shaw Foundation, the British Library, the UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation, and the Wiener Library. We are jointly proud to announce the formation of a group which will oversee the creation of a UK Holocaust testimony portal. The aim of the portal is to create a digital space which can serve as a signpost and learning resource for larger and smaller collections in the UK. Holocaust testimonies the portal will facilitate an overview of various collections, create greater access for, for future users of testimony, and provide innovative ways of sharing data and information. We hope to create this UK Holocaust te uh, testimony portal that it will be the, one of the digital projects delivered during the British presidency of IRA. It is a coalition, it is an, an alliance for the truth, but it's not a passive one. It will be used as a weapon to undermine Holocaust distortion. Finally, I would like to congratulate the Association of British Refugees to bring us all, brought us all together to discuss the importance of Holocaust testimony. And I very much look forward to the next two days. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Bea Lefkowitz. I'm the director of the AGR Refugee Voices Archive. Lord Ahmed Lok Pickles, Your Excellency, speakers, colleagues, and friends. I'm very excited to welcome you to the International Testimony Forum today. After months of planning and corresponding with all the speakers, it is wonderful to see you here in person, 
in this magnificent room of Lancaster House. I'm looking forward to listening to your presentations and to thought-provoking questions and discussions over the next two days. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the survivors and refugees who have joined us today. I'm thrilled that you can be with us. Without your willingness to share your stories and commitment to Holocaust education, we would not be standing here thinking about the past and future of Holocaust testimonies. Thank you. The last thank you goes to all my colleagues uh, at the AJR, Lancaster House, the Foreign Office and Department for Communities Leveling Up. Thank you for your dedication and hard work in making the idea of the International Testimony Forum into a reality. A special thank you to Susan Harrod and Susanna Kleeman and to Michael Newman for his steadfast support of Refugee Voices from its inception and for his vision for the future of the AJR. In my presentation today, I will talk about the history of Holocaust testimonies and give you a short overview of the themes covered in this forum. I will also explore some of the challenges we need to address when working with testimonies. And I will briefly talk about the AJR Refugee Voices Testimony Archive, which in January this year celebrated its 20th anniversary. In 1989, I found myself in the city of Thessaloniki in Greece as an undergraduate student doing research on the Jewish community. The city, once called Jerusalem of the Balkans, had a tragic history as more than 45,000 of its Jewish inhabitants had been deported by the Nazis to concentration camps and only about 1,000 men and women survived and returned to the city in 1945. Shortly after my arrival, I met some of these survivors. One of them was a man called Samuel Profeta, lovingly called Theo Sam, Uncle Sam, in the community. I was told that he had been experimented on by Mengele, and he told me that he made an oath in Auschwitz that if he survived, he would dedicate his life to the children's education, which is what he did. When I asked him about the deportation uh, of Jews from Thessaloniki in March 43, he said to me, and I quote, we went to the Konzentrationslager in March 43. Every week, 3,000 people arrived in Auschwitz, very few for work, and others went to the crematorium. It is very difficult. I feel sick when I speak about the Konzentrationslager. A few minutes later, he said, I cannot speak much because I get sick from this story. Do you understand? And soon after, he asked me to stop the interview. When I returned to Thessaloniki in 1994, I interviewed him again, and this time he was able to share more of his story with me. He told me that his mother and two sisters were murdered in Auschwitz and that he weighed 27 kilos when he was liberated. After five minutes of talking about his camp experiences, he said, quote, that's the story from the concentration camp, and moved on to the post-war time. I went along with his narrative, as my research focus was the post-war Jewish community, and I did not want to ask him further painful questions about his experiences at Auschwitz. As far as I know, no other interviews with Samuel Profeta was ever recorded. When I, um, when I came back, when I was in Thessaloniki in 1989, Jewish history was not visible in the city. There were no monuments, no museums, no plaques. Memory of the Holocaust had stayed within the Jewish community, which is very different uh, today. The collective memory of the city had not yet incorporated the history of the Jewish community. So when I, as a young researcher without a familiar institutional backup, conducted interviews in the late 80s and early 90s, many of the survivors were not ready to talk. But I was also not ready to confront the interviewees and ask them to share details of their painful memory. It was only a few years later when the Salonican survivors felt they were able to publicly share their experiences. And this brings us right to the core of this International Holocaust Testimony Forum and why we thought the topic of Holocaust testimonies should be addressed here over the next two days. In a conversation between scholars, archivists, educators, politicians, next generations, and the general public. As we're transitioning to an era in which survivors of the Holocaust will no, no longer be alive, we are becoming custodians of large collections of testimony archives. Holocaust testimonies in various forms have more and more come to center stage. For example, in the planned learning center near Westminster and also the new Holocaust Museum, uh, which, is which is going to be open in June in Toronto in Canada. 
As testimonies will replace eyewitness accounts, we need to develop a deeper understanding of the history of Holocaust testimonies, and we need to cultivate our testimonial literacy, a term coined by the Australian-based academic Noah Schenker. What does this strange-sounding concept, testimonial literacy, refer to? It refers to the general factors which need to be taken into account when dealing with the source of Holocaust testimonies. There are macro factors and micro factors which shape the nature and the content of these testimonies. So on the macro factors, firstly, there are the communal, national, and international collective remembrance practices, and they're important, which some scholars refer to as collective memory, a concept developed by the French sociologist Maurice Halbwax, who perished in Buchenwald in February 45. This includes public commemoration, memorial days, the creations of museums and archives. The idea is that these larger frames of remembrance shape the expression of individual memory and create spaces of remembrance. For example, through the creation of International Holocaust Memorial Day in the year 2000, when 46 governments signed the Stockholm Declaration of the, Estab of the Establishment uh, of International uh, Holocaust Memorial Day uh, in 2000, but also as we heard, Yom HaShoah, which was institutionalized in Israel in 1953. Secondly, on that macro level, we have legal proceedings which created spaces for use of personal testimony. And thirdly, and importantly, are the technological developments which determine how we capture and record personal testimonies. On the micro level, we have institutional protocols and interventions, the camera setup, the style of questions, the allocated time for an interview, the style of interview. Then we have, of course, the encounter between the interviewee and the interviewer and the relationship between them. And thirdly, we have the general frame conditions of an interview, the language of an interview, the age of the interviewee, the location of the interview. Um, Jeffrey Hartman, one of the founders of the Fortune of Video Archive, which started recording interviews in 1979, he also escaped, he escaped on a kinder transport from Germany. He was uh, particularly interested in this concept and this has been used by quite a few uh, memory scholars, the idea of, of framing. Later today in session three, we will be discussing some of these micro conditions when discussing producing Holocaust testimonies with interviewers Natasha Kaplinsky and Rosalind Lifshin and survivors Eva Clark and Jackie Young and kinder transportee Kurt Marx. I think it is useful at the beginning of our International Testimony Forum to look at the key historical moments which shaped the collection of the Holocaust testimonies we have inherited and created. At the outset, I should say that testimony, defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as an example of spoken or written statement that something is true, of course includes a large amount of various sources, books, newspapers, diaries, and letters. While well, this forum will focus on the emergence and use of audio and video Holocaust testimonies in particular, we should not forget that the early efforts of creating testimony on the Holocaust started during the Holocaust itself. For example, through the actions of Emanuel Ringelbaum, who Lord Pickles mentioned earlier, but also the early Yisko books, their memorial books. And these, the first of these books about Lodge Ghetto um, was published already in 1943 in America. And 900 of these Yisko books, uh, which were privately published from the mid-40s until the early 70s, mainly in Yiddish and Hebrew, uh, um, remember these vanished communities. And their amazing testimonials and memorials, which have been made more accessible recently, as they have been translated into English. And I sometimes think, you know, the, the interview, in a way, today, corresponded to these early Yisko books, because that's what the... Um, the survivors, they got together and created these, these, these books. The earliest recorded Holocaust testimonies are the ones, as a collection, I should say, are the ones carried out by the Latvian Jewish psychologist David Boda over nine months in 1946. He collected 90 hours of testimony with 130 survivors recorded on 200 wire spools. And you can listen to these testimonies on the Voices of the Holocaust website. And I have to say, it's a remarkable that today, we can listen to these recordings 80 years later, and I would recommend anyone to go onto that website. Session one will deal explicitly with these early testimonies. As part of the early efforts to collect testimonies, we also need to mention the Polish Jewish writer Rachel Auerbach, 
who has been a member of the Onik Shabbat, Shabbat archive of the Warsaw Ghetto, and to establish the, the Department for Testimony collection of Yad Vashem, the then newly created Holocaust Memorial and Museum in Israel in 1954. And we're going to hear from Yad Vashem in session four. In her work on Holocaust testimony, French historian Annette Vivorka points out that in the post-war era, the survivors did not emerge as a collective group, and thus, um, therefore, their efforts to create public or collective remembrance were not successful. And that's kind of difficult to think about today where we have a notion of uh, survivors as a, as a collective. One of such, failed, um, such failings was a planned memorial in the Upper West Side in New York in Riverside Park. A cornerstone was placed in 1947. Permission to build a huge memorial was given in 1952, but the memorial was never built. The corner piece is still there, and I came across it by chance when I went for a walk in Riverside Park, and it's an interesting history of, of non memorials which were not built, and I'm sure there are many others. A very important milestone in terms of Holocaust testimony and memory is undoubtedly the Eichmann trial in 1961. The prosecutor, Gideon Hausner, decided to give eyewitnesses a central role in the proceedings. These testimonies were shared through radio and television channels. Some scholars think that it was from that moment of the Eichmann trial that the era of the witnesses began. In terms of popular culture, the series Holocaust, produced by NBC in 1978, contributed greatly to bringing the topic of the Holocaust into the public realm. It was watched by an estimated 120 million people in the US and by about 20 million in West Germany, and it was a very important um, watershed moment in, in West Germany. In the same year, President Carter established the present Commission of the Holocaust, which eventually led to the creation uh, of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. Interestingly, another mainstream Hollywood film, Schindler's List, released in 1993, led to the foundation of the UC USC Shaw Foundation in 1994, which today contains the largest collection of Holocaust testimonies and survivors of other genocides. We are privileged to have its director, Dr. Robert Williams, address us tomorrow afternoon. In the late 80s and early 90s, local initiative, museums, and memorials worldwide started interviewing Holocaust survivor. I'd like to welcome my colleagues from Canada and Australia, who you can hear in session five, from France, session six, Germany and Austria in session seven, who will tell us about some of these initiatives. In the same time frame, the Holocaust memory, memory scape of the UK started to change. Existing institutions, such as the Imperial War Museum and the British Library, started to collect interviews and also became repositor repositories of large collection of interviews. In 1988, the Holocaust Educational Trust, with its mission to educate young people about the Holocaust, was founded. In 1989, the first kinder transport reunion took place. In other parts of the UK, other Holocaust institutions were formed. The National Holocaust Center and Museum, then known as Bet Shalom, opened near Nottingham in 1995. And in the same year, the Holocaust Survivors Friendship Association was founded in Leeds, today known as Holocaust Center North. The year 2000 saw the opening of the first Holocaust galleries at the Imperial War Museum. And in 2001, the UK government organized the first Holocaust Memorial Day. More than a decade later, in 2014, the then Prime Minister David Cameron established a Holocaust Commission, which led to the formation of the UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation, aiming to create a Holocaust Museum and Learning Center next to Westminster. We will learn more about the plans for the Learning Center and the interview collections and educational efforts of all these institutions from our colleagues in sessions four, five, and six. I think this short history is important as it helps us to understand the memorial landscape and context in which testimonies were collected and were collected and gathered. When Dr. Anthony Granville and I co-founded the Refugee Voices Archive for the Association of Jewish Refugees in 2003, following the Continental Britain's exhibition we had produced for the 60th anniversary of the AJR 20 years ago, we were aware that no other national British video archive of Holocaust survivor existed. And we were also aware that the story of the Jewish refugees from Nazi Europe had not yet fully been told. 
exemplified by the fact that there was little mention of the refugees in the, in the first Holocaust galleries at the Imperial War Museum, again, which is different from the current exhibition. We were also aware that it was important to interview all across the UK to represent the many different places where people settled and to interview underrepresented groups, for example, from the Orthodox community. In 2003, the time was right and many survivors and refugees wanted to tell their story and still do. We have a, quite a long waiting list now for interviews at the moment. They also felt that they wanted to tell it in the framework of an AJR project, an organization set up by Jewish refugees in 1941. The fact that Refugee Voices was led by two second generation academics, Dr. Granville and myself, possibly also helped. In 2003, we were still able to interview women and men who were born near the end, uh, near the last turn of the century. Our oldest interviewee was born in 1906, Margaret Simmons, and we just about managed to interview some men and women who were educators, leaders, or rescuers, such as Max Abram from Berlin, mentioned by Michael Newman, uh, who was a teacher at the old school, or Arya Handler from Magdeburg, who traveled in and out of Germany to find places for young Jews to emigrate, and who was in charge of the religious Zionist training centers, Hachsharot, and hostels during the war. And we also managed to interview London-born Helen Bamber, who went to Bergen-Belsen with the Jewish Relief Unit. Our youngest interviewee, Eva Clark, born five days before liberation in Mauthausen concentration camp in April 1945, is here with us today. I'm very proud that 20 years after we conducted our first interview, we have captured the life histories of more than 285 survivors and refugees from Nazi Europe. And this also includes now a growing number of second and third generation interviews. On the occasion of our 20th anniversary, we're here today to think about the legacy of Holocaust testimonies and to think about the best ways of using these testimonies for education and remembrance. And you can see some samples of the way uh, the AJR Refugee Voices has disseminated the stories of our interviewees. There are 20 panels from the exhibition Double Exposure, which we prepared some years ago with the refugees from Austria for an exhibition in Vienna. And you can find a detailed catalog on your link tree if you want to know more about the, the 20 people and portraits. Um, you can also see two panels in the other room on an exhibition on the history of 10 kinder, still in our hands. And throughout the day, in the entrance and on those two screens and the break times, we prepared an assembly of 20 short recollections which we have released on social media and which we are going to release on social media. You can also see clips from our social media campaign, Why Holocaust Testimony Matters. And I'd like to invite you to use our hashtag, please, and to film short clips for us. If you're willing to be filmed, please let an AJR staff member know, and we can take down, film your message. While many Holocaust historians regarded Holocaust testimonies as marginal in the past, survivor testimony today has become a valued source for historians. In a lecture in 2018, Christopher Browning stated, quote, using survivor testimony has difficulties. It is problematic evidence, but all historical evidence is problematic one way or the other. But the issue is not do we use it, but how do we use it? To not use survivor memories is to lose whole areas of the Holocaust that we have no other set of evidence for. And to me, this statement is true for so many of the Refugee Voices interviews who recall things that would otherwise not be recorded or known about. The interviewees recall the lives of the parents and grandparents who did not survive. They recall particular experiences pre and post emigration, pre and post war, in a camp, in hiding, in a hostel, in domestic service, in a foster family, in internment, or in the army. And they recall particular people who helped them, for example, some better known people like the Dutch Truce Weissmuller, who was responsible for the first kinder transport and, the, uh, and also the last kinder transport from Holland on the SS Bodegrafen. Or they recall the labor leader, the then labor leader Clement Attlee, who hosted one of our interviewees, Paul Willer. Um, but they also recall unknown men and women. For example, the London pediatrician Bernard Schlesinger who rescued 12 children from Berlin and set up a hostel in Highgate. And there's so many other people uh, recalled in those interviews. 
Some of these captured memories have already and will be in the future, uh, will in the future contribute to a more decentralized, localized form of Holocaust commemoration embodied in Stolpersteine, plaques, memory benches, and digital learning tools like the AGR's UK Holocaust map. In session two, we will discuss in detail the value of oral history testimony as a historical source for refugee and Holocaust studies. This forum will also explore the broader uses of testimony in art, drama, and nonfiction literature in sessions seven and eight, and for presentation by second and third generation speakers who are responding to the growing demand for Holocaust-related speakers. That's tomorrow in session nine. Now, we need to be aware that there are three major challenges for anyone working with Holocaust testimonies. The first one is the huge quantity of material, sometimes difficult to access. Uh, a study which was published estimates uh, that there are 115,000 testimonies worldwide uh, gathered by 139 organizations in 21 countries. And I'm sure by now there are probably more than that. And many interviews are not transcribed. The second challenge is that we need to find innovative and respectful ways to engage younger audience, mostly on social media, and to create educational uh, resources also in the fight against Holocaust distortion and denial. And thirdly, we need to find ways of protecting the testimonies from digital manipulation, as we just heard from Lord Pickles. This is a huge challenge, as voices, images, and video can easily be replicated and altered. One way of coping with the sheer number of interviews is to create portals, which is just a name for a central digital umbrella, uh, a, a digital space, and research networks, and session seven and 10 will deal with, with those. I estimate that the number of UK Holocaust testimony is around 2,000 to 2,500. It is in our power to make these interviews more accessible. And the first step announced by Lord Pickles today is the creation of a portal which will cross-reference interviewees by name so that we can easily see who was interviewed, when and where. It will be very interesting for researchers to compare different interviews with the same person carried out by different projects over different periods of time. By mapping these memories, we can also cross-reference documents and other material relating to specific testimony. Many of the Refugee Voices interviewees have, documented, have documents relating to their lives in the archive of World Jewish Relief. Relief. Others have deposited materials at the Wiener Library and the Imperial War Museum. So in the future, you should be able to Google the name of a British Holocaust survivor and find where and when he was interviewed, possibly see some of these interviews online, and be able to assess, to access documents relating to that person and his family. Each interview should also have as much metadata as possible attached to the interview about the project, about the methodology, location, etc. As each of our Refugee Voices interviewees has their own uh, web page, we get many requests from lost family members, researchers, writers, and in one instance from a man whose parents had fostered a refugee. It was wonderful that we were able to put him in touch with the kind who was taken in by his parents, and he could only find this person because he appeared on our website. In order to achieve some sort of centralized digital portal or database, it is imperative that organizations work together and overcome institutional boundaries. We need to establish a framework uh, which will highlight the testimonial offerings of each interviewee across different institutions, so that future users will be able to compare testimonies given over time and to different archives. In my interview with Helen Bamba in 2003, she told me that she realized how important it was for her to sit with the survivors and listen to their stories. Quote, they want me to listen, and my role is to be their witness and to say to them, that is my role. I can listen and I can be your witness. Today we should acknowledge the foresight of survivors and refugee memory and testimony scholars and activists who, like Helen Bamba, understood the importance of testimony. Rachel Auerbach at Yad Vashem, Eva Reichman at the Wiener Library, and Dori Laub and Geoffrey Hartman at Yale University, and many others. I feel as archives and individual, at this point in time, we have listened and we have and captured the story of many survivors and refugees. But we do need to recognize that not everyone was able to, to share their story, like Samuel Profeta from Thessaloniki, and that many people passed away before their story could have been recorded. 
It is now our duty to ensure that the stories which we have gathered will be safeguarded, made accessible, and shared, so that in the words of interviewee John Itzbicki, we can, quote, think of the past but not let it become the future. I hope this forum will inspire more national and international collaboration to fulfill this obligation to the best of our abilities and to help us think about the transformation from the era of the witness to the era of the user and beyond. Today, recorded Holocaust testimonies have become partners of contemporary historiography. But as the memory scholar Alaida Asman points out, quote, the unique value of this which he calls nemno-historical genre of video testimony, lies in fact that they can forge a transgenerational link between the faces and voices of victims and those listening to them. I think it is fitting to start the Forum on Holocaust Testimony with the words of the women and men who have entrusted us with their life stories, underlying the power of the transgenerational link between viewer and testimony. I've put together for you a 10 minutes version of a longer film called Voices for a Better World, The Legacy of Testimonies, with a message from Anita Lasker-Walfisch, especially recorded for this forum. Thank you. Jewish refugees from Germany, Austria and Czechoslovakia fled to Britain before the outbreak of World War II to escape systematic persecution by the Nazi regime. By 1939, about 60,000 refugees managed to emigrate to the UK on domestic service visas, transit visas, as unaccompanied children on the kinder transport or through other forms of sponsorship. They were joined after 1945 by a small number of Jewish children and young adults who had survived the war in Nazi Europe, often without their family, in concentration camps, in hiding, or with false identities. Another wave of refugees, many of them Holocaust survivors, came to Britain from Hungary in 1956. Since 2002, the AJR Refugee Voices Archive has captured the testimony of more than 250 of these refugees and survivors. In these oral history interviews, the interviewees recall the stories of their families and their childhood homes in places like Berlin, Vienna, Prague, Krakow, Cologne, Frankfurt, Bamberg, Bratislava, Bonn, Budapest, Munich, Hamburg, and many more. They recall their life journeys and the many challenges they faced. They reflect on their often traumatic experiences of separation and displacement and on their lives and achievements after the war. Some of the interviewees have been active Holocaust educators for many years. Some have never told their stories. Many interviewees who have given their testimony to the AJR Refugee Voices Archive are not alive anymore. This film captures the reflections, messages and hopes of the refugees and survivors in the United Kingdom who wanted their words and voices to be heard and who wanted future generations to reflect on the legacy of their testimonies. My message would be think of the past and don't let it become the future. If one so tries to be rational, uh, I was burgled from an early age, if you like. First they stole my childhood, then they stole my possessions, then they murdered my parents. This must 
affect your whole your whole being, your whole attitude, your whole everything. What happened to me is happened to thousands of us. Millions have been murdered. Of the thousands, hundreds are talking about it like I do. Good luck. Tell the world as much as possible. By telling, we won't forget those that have gone and hopefully it won't happen again. Well, I wish anti-Semitism was over and people learned from what has happened in the Holocaust, etc. I hope it never reoccurs. This Holocaust experience, we haven't learned anything. And I think that this is the message I would like to send, that one should learn that um, you don't achieve anything by killing people. And the Holocaust was a sort of most unique thing that's ever happened, actually. This technological planned murder of a group of people. You should have a right as a citizen. I mean, the fact that the Jews were citizens of these countries that killed them, they killed their own citizens, is unbelievable. I suppose take take an active part in political life and democracy is worth preserving. True democracy. So. I don't believe in words only. When you hear people at the moment, for instance, so often words, so many words, instead of actions. And I think you should act and you should act how you feel without trying to hurt other people. That's the main thing too. Whatever you do, try not to hurt other people. Not physically and not mentally. I would say, be very careful of any prejudice. Always treat everybody of whatever their color, their culture, their faith, whatever, however different of the, somebody else is, if they're different from you, they are still a human being. You have just learn what happened in Hitler's Germany. Please, please learn from that. Just don't even begin to think of anybody else as the other. I still give that message out that please don't hate. Um, try not to repeat the mistakes of previous people because killing people doesn't solve problems. About it. Only to try to think of other people as individuals and not to think of people en masse, not to stereotype. Uh, because there is such a thing as mob mentality and, and it can lead to dreadful things. And I'm not a nationalist. Uh, I really believe that the world uh, is in such difficulties because each one is too much a nationalist and does not think of the other person as a simple human being. And uh, uh, since you asked me, I would say, in a way, uh, I would like to be remembered in my life, not necessarily someone who, who helped the establishment of Israel. I did uh, help a little bit, but uh, I want to be remembered as a person who has respect for anybody else who is a good human being. 
And I would wish that that the world, when I'm gone, should go in this direction. As much as I can uh, to, uh, leave behind me, definitely my uh, hope that people learn to live with each other. I'll, if I look down from somewhere and see what's going on after my time has come, uh, then I'll watch out and see how much of that has improved. But it'll take generations. It will take generations. I have no illusions about that. For the future, listen to what the likes of us have had to say. Draw your own conclusions. But remember that this is not just a project about, um, about telling the stories of unhappiness and loss, but it, they should also be stories about gains and about the lessons that have been learned that can be applied for a future which will create more stable, better lives and bring people together rather than separate them. The whole reason why we have this interview is to let future generations know what kind of life we had so that they should have a better life and should not have to suffer for all the traumas we had to suffer. What has this achieved? There are so many testimonies, so much stuff. Have we made any progress? This is what I'm asking myself. And they are obviously uh, targeting young people, yes? Do you, can you really expect of young people nowadays to be all that concerned about what happened to the Jews, what is still happening to the Jews? It's, a, you know, a, it's optimistic and I hope you succeed, that's all I can say. Thank you very much, Bea, and uh, the team for putting the video together. Um, as you can see from your programs, we're already running a little bit late, but we do have a break now. Uh, there's coffee and refreshments at one of the side rooms through here. Um, but I would ask you to return promptly so we can start again at 11.15. Uh, so see you all shortly. Thank you.